an oasis of innovation for your mind, your soul, and your heart. Connect, act, and recharge with Remo Daily. This is Remo Daily. We'll bring you about 30 seconds of that song and maybe um, after the breakout, how's that? We'll let you, we'll, we'll, we'll let you online nope. in our Malay secret. No breakout today, but we'll do it oh. towards the end of the hour. Okay. Perfect. Sounds good. Sounds Thank good. you. And welcome back to the stage, our amazing guest today, Vivienne Ming. Vivienne, I hope you feel maybe a little bit different after this uh, mindfulness break. Uh, this has been quite an experience. Uh, I'm, I'm tingly and transformed. <laughs> um, I thought about what Jade said, because Jade said, you know, think of your why. And uh, I, I think my why, at least at this moment, is, is bringing people together. I really enjoy doing that. And it's what keeps me awake and, and up and energized. And I love doing it. And I heard and read about you that your why as a child was that what your parents instilled in you was you are a future Nobel Prize winner. You're set up for success. You have to be the best at everything. And that's your path. When was the first time you realized that that might not be your why, that you life, your life might take an entirely different path, which in the future, yeah. might still take you to a more noble price, but at that time was very hard for yeah. you. They have to get a little funky uh, with the Nobel Committee to want to give it to a mad scientist. Um, but who knows what the future might bring? Uh, so you know, let's. I, I obviously want to be really fair to my parents. They were amazing and loving. Uh, but my father was two things growing up: the smartest kid anyone had ever met graduated from the top of his class in the entire state of Kansas, which admittedly, maybe not a huge number of people, but, but he was also a sharecropper, which, you know, sounds like uh, a, a story, you know, a, a piece of fiction. I didn't even really understand this going, or growing up, but, you know, he always felt that his life had been one of underachievement, despite going from, you know, a farm in Kansas that, you know, Dorothy's never even heard of to uh, being a doctor in California. And so it was instilled in me very early that I had this opportunity to do what he didn't have the chance to do. And so, yeah, I was supposed to win a Nobel Prize. And that was really clear to me. Uh, it wasn't brutal. Uh, no one was cracking a whip. It was just an understanding. I, I even grew up, uh, I grew up in uh, the region that John Steinbeck is from. Uh, in fact, I grew up in a little valley that he wrote a book about called The Pastures of Heaven. So I grew up in the pastures of heaven, which by the way is west of east of Eden. So I also grew up in Eden, um, at least according to John Steinbeck. And I had a pretty amazing life. Uh, I was still a kid when things stopped working. The more I tried to be that person, the worse everything got. By the time I got to high school, where my son is now, I was flunking out of classes. I was sleeping through class. Uh, I was very unhappy, hated myself, um, and hated myself largely for just being such a failure. I'm supposed to win Nobel Prizes, and I can't even manage to pass my classes. Now, no one you know, thought that I, I couldn't uh, in some theoretical sense. But no one knew how to get it out of me, me least of all. And by the time, purely based on standardized test scores that I went off to university, I flunked all of my classes, uh, uh, got ejected, and ended up homeless. Um, and, you know, there's a, the 90s are not my favorite decade. I, I don't have a lot of fond memories of wondering where my next meal is coming from or uh, 
literally counting days. I had a calendar in 1995 and I was just crossing off days until the end, um, figuratively and literally. Uh, and because it's America, I even had the gun with which to do it. So, you know, that was this moment where uh, I started in this amazing place and everything both internally and externally got worse and worse and worse. I'd never really achieved anything. Uh, I'd never been particularly happy, you know, boo-hoo, shed a tear for the poor kid from coastal California. But it was, for me, I mean, let me put it this way. Given the work that I do nowadays, looking back on that like it's a different person, I don't understand how I was even allowed to fail. Um, Given every, I've, I've had the chance to found uh, six companies. I have uh, in my life as a scientist at, at UC Berkeley and Stanford, I've, I've published research that have affected people's lives. None of it should have happened. Uh, I should never have gotten out of 95. Um, why I didn't pull the trigger is still hard for me to articulate, um, but I didn't. And I spent a solid 10 years still hating myself, but I learned a, a, a lesson uh, over this, over the 90s. And it was a really brutal one, but I, I learned it, which is that it's not about me. And it's not about whether I'm happy or not. Uh, I, at, by that point, I pretty much assumed I would never be happy. Uh, so either I pull the trigger or I find some other reason to be alive. And that reason, which will sound very sort of uh, self-congratulatory or, um, I don't know, absurd, but I just needed a way to make decisions. That decision was live a life that makes other people's lives better. Mine will never be. It's fundamentally broken. I'm a sort of self-destructive perfectionist, so I can never get back. If any of you ever obsessively play games like Civilization, I was the kind of nerdy kid that would play Civilization and start over again if anything went wrong. I'd pay for like 30 hours straight and everything had to go perfectly or I would delete the game and start all over again. So here's a life that could never be perfect. My life is, remains today, fundamentally broken. How much could I have done with all of those years that I didn't do? I'll never get them back doesn't matter anymore. Uh, it's not about me, which is the lesson I have really brought forward uh, in my life. So at the time, I just dreamed, boy, I wonder if I could get a job at a bookstore and I could just like, you know, confess to my parents that I was homeless. I was clever enough to keep all that hidden and um, get a job at a bookstore and read science fiction for the rest of my life. That just, that was what I aspired to. And um and I got a, I did get a job at a convenience store. Uh, and then I managed an abalone store in Santa Cruz, California, which deserves its own story. Um, but it turns out if you spend two years working with the largest snail in the world, suddenly you get an interest in brains. So I had the money to, to go back to school. Uh, now, again, same school, the school I flunked out of, never having had significant academic success in my entire life. So I went back and I flipped a coin between economics and neuroscience, came up heads. So I study brains. That is a literal thing that happened in my life, including the, the, the dumb punniness of it. <laughs> and I did my entire undergraduate degree uh, in a single year and got perfect scores in every class. Oh. Uh, and here is a, the dirty secret of that time. I still hated myself. I was still a failure, but when I, the, one of the first classes, I, the only programming course I've ever taken, I got a perfect score. The professor invited me in, congratulated me, recommended me to work at this place called the Machine Perception Lab that was my introduction to artificial intelligence. I had no knowledge of it or interest in it before that moment, transformed the rest of my life. I walked away from that meeting as low as I've ever felt because I didn't win a Nobel Prize. Uh, in my introduction to programming course. That was the standard that had to be met for me to be happy. Uh, and so I wasn't happy, but it wasn't about me. That was the thing I kept telling myself, just keep pushing forward. Uh, 
I got my choice of where I wanted to go to grad school and what I wanted to study. I told people I wanted to build cyborgs and they'd literally scoot away from me for fear that the crazy would rub off. Um, and yet I did. I got to build one of the first machine learning algorithms for cochlear implants so that people could actually hear better what was going on around them, particularly if you were older and your brain isn't as plastic and ready to learn. I got to do all of these things. And then, forgive the story and the long build up here, then about 10 years after the night with the gun. So we're talking 2005. So now 2005. October 19th, so my birthday is um, coming up here. Uh, it's my birthday, October 19th. Uh, I'm in graduate school at Carnegie Mellon University with my then fiance, who is a few rooms away from me. And I said, as we were about to fall asleep, you wanna know my deep dark secret? I said, I wish I was a woman. Well, good night. And I rolled over to go back to bed because wow. I was just sharing. I, I literally, it came out of nowhere. It wasn't planned. Obviously, I'd thought about this for a very long time. No, this is not the only thing that had been holding me back all these years. Obviously, my life at that point externally was wonderful. I mean, I, I was had a, a potential uh, professorship at MIT lined up and everything was amazing. It isn't the time most people think, you know what I should do? Uh, life is too easy. Let's switch up to advanced level. We're going to do it all backwards and heels. Um, but I said this thing and I, I guess I missed one beat here, which is the preceding 20 years, one of the defining characteristics of my life had been insomnia. Uh, I'd regularly watch the sun come up. Uh, it was brutal, like scary brutal. I'd seen neurologists about it. So that night, my wife, my fiance, and I stayed up all night talking. Um, and then the next night my head hit the pillow and I fell right to sleep. And I've never had a night of insomnia since, which is amazing. It's, it's again, I'm a hard number scientist, but uh, if there's magic in the world, that is the closest I've ever come to it. I said a thing and my life was completely changed in every way uh, subsequent to that. And, um, you know, even though my life was headed in a good direction, it probably would be a very comfortable secretly self-loathing professor at a very good school somewhere right now. Instead, I have invented things. There are thousands of people who are alive because of things I've invented and people that have had jobs because of companies I've created. Um, and, I, and I say that and I'm not avoiding how self-congratulatory it is. I just want to point out the seeming irony of it, which is my mantra today remains that it's not about me. Uh, every good thing I have in my life came from walking away from all the good things that I was supposed to be achieving uh, and trying to build something that had a bigger impact uh, on the world than it did on me. Uh, and so all those times we, we discussed earlier where I walked away from being the chief scientist at some brand name company uh, in fact, I can say definitively, you cannot pay me $10 million to be alone in a room with Travis Kalanick, the co-founder of Uber. Um, it's my life gets better. Every time I made one of those stupid decisions, at least as some people see it, my life got better again and again and again. So yeah, it's uh, sorry and that I dragged you all through this long story, but uh, it, that was a hard lesson to learn. And what I would hate the most is that someone had to go through what I went through to learn it. And to add one thing, because you said what you invented saved so many lives, to add one more stop on your journey that brought you where you are today. I'm going to share your uh, header picture from Twitter, actually, uh, with your wonderful family and children to point you daughter, to 2011. In that photo. I'm sorry? I said my daughter was not thrilled in that photo. <laughs> my son is normally the one that's a challenge, but uh, for some reason she was unhappy. Yeah, uh, we got to, those are photos we were taking, amazingly enough for Oprah. Uh, we got to meet Gail King and do the whole media thing. Uh, uh, and yeah, that was us. 
uh, boy, a while ago, you can see me wearing actually Google it Glass? looks like an older version. This is the more <laughs> recent version of Google Glass I have. Um, yeah, uh, that was Wait, an amazing what, time. Where's the more recent version of Google Glass? You just held that oh, into you the saw camera. The picture that one is gray. Yeah. So. They gave me, that this was an early one. release okay. pair before they put them out. So they gave me a pair to come up with ideas of things to do with it. Got it. But I was sharing this picture because of your son. Because one of the people that you saved, and you said that quickly in the beginning, because you hacked his medical equipment, was your son being diagnosed with diabetes. And it sent you down this path of founding a company that would just trying to repeat that moment of helping someone and then sharing something that's for the greater world. So I had this chance. I, I, I wish for every, we, uh, there were some parents uh, posting in the comments. I wish for every parent to be that person, that, want, that unique person that can truly change the course of your child's life. And of course we all are, but you know, that when, this diagnosis came out of the blue. The fact that I just happened to have a skill set that made a difference. And it's not like life is easy. He has autism and type one diabetes. Um, sometimes he has a hard night, but I get to sit down with him and say, that because you were a tough kid that got through this, because we just happened to be the right family to deal with this. Uh, thousands of people will be alive because of you. He gets to, to, to carry that forward when he's having a tough time. But actually I, I have, when I was starting my very first company, it was an ed tech company. No one wanted to fund my wife and I, no one wanted to fund education. This is before Coursera and Khan Academy and so forth. They'd hear our pitches and say, wow, you can read students' minds. Here's $2 million if you do financial fraud detection. And I've got the perfect CEO. So they'd fire me as I was literally sitting across the seat from them. But, um, Along came the UN and Ericsson, and they were working on a project, uh, supporting a project called Refugees United to reunite orphan refugees with extended family members. So if you wanna know why I believe that AI can do good, not because it's magic, not simply because you add AI, but because it's a powerful tool. And if you understand a problem, it can help bring a solution out into the world. It can also do terrible things, but this is a case where we built this system and I, I probably don't have time for the whole story, but let's just, I invented a game called Sexy Face. People played it, our algorithm learned about faces from this. And then we used it to match orphan refugees and refugee camps around the world with their extended family members. So they just have to like look on a tablet and select faces and within three to five minutes, if your niece was in a camp anywhere in the world, you found her. Well, here's my lesson about courage. Uh, no one wanted to fund our company at the time. We were doing all of this for free. And so I wrote to Erickson. I said, I'm so sorry, but we just, we can't keep doing this. I'm, I'm going to, my business is going to go under. And I pulled out and it was the worst decision I ever made. We went back later, bailed out the whole system, but you know, the, the moment was gone. And I learned my lesson that there was an opportunity there to do real good in the world. And in retrospect, would I have given up my company to have saved one single kid? Of course I would have. What a terrible decision to have been made in fear and without being ready for it. So that case of failure was as, as big an inspiration as the success with my son, seeing that I had the chance to make a difference and I chose not to because I was scared. Um, and so I thought, Let's just go completely all in. Uh, the whole point of this crazy lab is to lose all of my money every year. Uh, and through that, to hopefully make a bit of a difference. And the wonderful thing is every year I get to lose more money. Uh, and every year we get to work on more projects. And it's been a truly amazing thing. But how do you then actually make the money that keeps you running? My life has been very good over the years. I've started a couple of companies that have had some modest success. Uh, started another one recently in public health. Turns out 
not a very sexy space to be starting a company, but almost all of the years gained um, over the last, you know, all of the, the increase in longevity over the last 50 years, almost exclusively from public health, things like chronic stress, causally related to the loss of 23.3 million quality adjusted years of life, only from ischemic heart disease, just in 2016. Roll in type 2 diabetes, major depression, bipolar disorder, and chronic stress is, is a scourge. So we figured let's do something about this. Uh, and we're launching, a, again, what started just purely as a philanthropic scientific initiative, but turns out it has legs. We were just trying to end suicide in, uh, you know, non gender nonconforming teens and developed a system that maybe can help a lot of people. Um, and another idea with a lot more heart than good business sense. So we, we're th we throw it out into the world and every now and then things like that help enough people that they really do uh, help uh, fund the people that have nothing and, and need their own chances. And then it turns out every now and then some of these stories also have legs. In the last month, uh, Lego, Netflix, and Random House have all reached out about doing things with our lab, which is, I mean, that's amazing. It's amazing that our stories touch people, um, maybe even do some of the work that we're trying to do just through narrative. But um, again, got to keep in mind, uh, it's not about me. Uh, it's, it's, a, I have a hard rule. I never read anything about myself. I never watch myself in videos. Um, not because I'm afraid people will say bad things about me. I mean, if you've got this face, that's inevitable, but rather because, um, I'm afraid they'll say something nice and I'll believe them. Uh, and then it all will slip away. So I'm, I'm pretty almost religious about just focusing on getting the work done and letting it tell its own story. Wow. I think your face is beautiful, by the way, and I really mean it. And even if you don't want to hear it, I'm going to say it. I, so. I, I, I got this one piece of feedback, the only piece of feedback I've ever received from an executive coach. He said, you need to stop grimacing when people pay you compliments. So he gave me this actually very <laughs> wonderful piece of advice. Imagine they've given you an actual physical gift whether you believe them or not, just accept the gift <laughs> with real gratitude. So thank you. I completely believe everything you just said. Um, <laughs> let's just be honest. Uh, someone who's approaching their 50th birthday and has gone through gender transition sometimes are a little sensitive uh, about their wrinkles. But uh, I, I thank you so much. And Anne just added in the chat, you're beautiful inside and out, Vivienne. So just quoting Anne here in the chat. Um, and you are accepting it. Uh, thank you, Vivienne. And you have two books coming up that are both behind you, I believe, uh, on the wall. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, The Tax on Being Different, uh, which is about our research looking at the literal, in some cases, dollar value cost of being different in the world, whether it's about mm -hmm. gender or race or um, disability or beyond. Uh, combined with uh, some elements of my own personal story. Uh, I just, I couldn't write just an autobiography. So instead uh, I have to interleave it with my research. And the other is how to robot proof your kids. Uh, sort of the convergence of education and the future of work and you know all the work we do with artificial intelligence to just understand because so many people, parents, educators, business leaders ask me you know, like, what's the one skill everyone right. should know? There is no such skill. Uh, that's like asking me, what's the one company I should put all of my money into for the next 50 years? That's absurd. Build a child that learns how to learn and let them figure it out for themselves. Uh, if I were to put a 500 page book into one line. Um, and for that matter, uh, Build employees that do that and communities that do that uh, and yourself. So uh, it's, I admit, I'm very wonky and nerdy. There's some, there's 
there's some equations in both books uh, and there's some graphs, but there's also a lot of F-bombs and dumb jokes. So everyone will be offended and feel left out. <laughs> Fantastic, amazing. Um, Vivienne, uh, I can't believe that we're at the end of the hour because I feel we just spent five minutes with one another and that, you know, um, there are so many things that we haven't even gotten a chance to really talk about that you're working on that are touching people's lives every day. But that is basically me saying, please come back um, to continue. And uh, lots of uh, reactions here in the gallery you tell me that, yes, we should do that. Um, and if you have time, uh, we would love to have you back when your books are out so we can share them with this community, with the multipliers here in the room and get them out into the world and into many hands and ears and eyes. We always pass the mic back at the end of the hour to our guests and ask for a final message for maybe a mantra for um, something that is happening right now that you would like to announce or just anything that comes to your mind. So just anything before the weekend. My mind. Well, I would love to be back. Let me start with that. And I Thank promise you. I will bring what everyone always wants, equations. Um, it's a good way to put an audience to sleep. We can substitute <laughs> that in for mindfulness. Um, but uh, gosh, uh, a big takeaway line. Um, try this on. Uh, and, and, and I mean it with the kind of mathematical substance that I try and do my own work. If you want an amazing life, and I've got literally trillions of data points uh, around that very question. If you want an amazing life, you have to give it to someone else. My drop. I got. If you feel comfortable switching on your camera and sharing some virtual glitter for our amazing guests, professional mad scientist Vivian Ming, please do so now. Vivian Ming, uh, thank you. It was such an honor.